Who has never looked into the Milky Way on a beautiful summer night? What could be sweeter and more soothing than to look for the one that seems to be the most beautiful, the brightest, the most accessible among this myriad of stars? What if I proposed you an incredible journey in the Milky Way? Are you ready to go on an adventure through our galaxy? Are you ready to face the infinitely big? I promise you a round trip without any bad encounter, neither meteorite nor asteroid. But before that, if you haven't already done so, think about liking the video and subscribing to support the channel. Thanks to all, and have a nice trip. You have certainly already observed the Milky Way. From our beautiful planet Earth, you just have to look up at the sky on a beautiful starry night. You can sometimes distinguish a large whitish band, which is none other than an accumulation of an incalculable number of stars. The Milky Way owes its name to this milky appearance. This whitish band forms an arc of about 30 degrees in the dark sky. The Milky Way, even though it does not appear that bright to the naked eye, shines like 10 billion suns. However, its light is largely blurred by the light of the moon, but especially by light pollution. This is why, in order to observe the Milky Way at its best, it is necessary to visit the zones farthest from the night lights. After having fled the artificial light, it is also necessary to avoid the radiation of the moon and to choose a moment when the latter is located under the horizon. Not all of the Milky Way is visible from Earth, but about 30 constellations can be observed. It extends beyond the north, where we can see the constellation of Cassiopeia to the south, with the constellation of the Southern Cross. The galactic plane is tilted about 60 degrees from the plane of the Earth's orbit. Because of this strong inclination, depending on the time of year, the Milky Way can appear either very high or very low in the sky. But this visible part is in fact only a cross-section of the Milky Way. A thousand to three thousand light years thick, the Milky Way is the galaxy that hosts our solar system. In the form of a spiral, the Milky Way extends over about 100,000 light years and has 100 to 400 billion stars, including our Sun. We can quantify just as many planets, but counting the exact number of stars that make up the Milky Way is impossible. Astronomers estimate their number by relying on the mass of these gigantic structures. But there's a major problem. The Milky Way is not only composed of stars. Our galaxy, in addition to stars, includes dark dust clouds, black holes, brown dwarfs, stars, planets, asteroids, comets, and other matter whose nature remains unknown to this day including the mysterious dark matter. On the other hand, we can attest that the smallest stars, such as red and brown dwarfs, are the most numerous. The much larger stars are much less frequent, and generally, as for the majority of the stars, many exotic planets orbit around them. Thus, the Milky Way is the galaxy to which our solar system belongs. Like a spiral, it has a central hub, which is a supermassive black hole. The mass of the latter is estimated at 4 million times that of the Sun. This central point is surrounded by a spherical galactic halo, composed mainly of stars and globular clusters. This halo is bounded by two satellites of the Milky Way, the large and small Magellanic Clouds. These mark a boundary between which the orbit of the objects seem no longer influenced by the Milky Way. From its center, several spiral arms start, including the Ruler Arm, the Southern Cross Arm, the Sagittarius Arm, the Orion Arm, where our solar system is located, and the Perseus Arm, which is the furthest from the center of the galaxy. Our solar system, which is located in the arm of Orion, is almost on the periphery of our galaxy. The distance that separates it from the galactic core is estimated at about 28,000 light years. However, 
space has no limit, and our Milky Way belongs itself to a group of galaxies called the Local Group. This group, composed of about 50 galaxies, also includes another galaxy of larger size, the Andromeda Galaxy. This cluster of galaxies is itself part of the Virgo Supercluster, itself belonging to an even larger structure, the Laniakea Supercluster. If we all wonder how stars and galaxies are born, we now have some answers, thanks to the research program of the European mission Gaia. Some 800,000 million years after the Big Bang, approximately 13 billion years ago, the universe experienced a very active period. The first dwarf galaxies were born. By merging, they were structured into more massive galaxies, such as our Milky Way. Our Milky Way is thus the result of a collision between two other smaller galaxies, approximately 10 billion years ago. From this collision, some stars were ejected into tumultuous orbits, forming the halo of the present Milky Way. During the following 4 billion years, chaotic star formations appeared, giving us our Milky Way, practically as we know it today. Just like other spiral galaxies, our Milky Way is in constant motion and follows a rotation curve. The stars, interstellar gas, and ordinary matter in the Milky Way rotate around the galactic center in a way that is not related to their distance from it. The gravitational attraction between two celestial bodies can completely override celestial mechanics. Therefore, according to Kepler's laws, celestial bodies orbiting a more massive body experience an acceleration of their speed when they approach it, as well as a slowing down when they move away from it. Moreover, according to the standard model of the Big Bang, distant celestial bodies are probably influenced by dark matter, which does not emit or absorb electromagnetic waves. Although our galaxy seems huge to us, on the scale of the universe, it becomes infinitely small. In 2016, the Hubble Space Telescope estimates that there are nearly 2 trillion galaxies, yet our galaxy alone includes at least 100 billion planets and 100 to 400 billion stars. In 2013, observations from the Kepler Telescope assume that there are a minimum of 40 billion Earth-sized planets, each orbiting a star in the habitable zone of planetary systems, centered on a twin of the Sun or a red dwarf. It should also be noted that our Milky Way is a path taken by stars outside our galaxy. About 20 have been identified, traveling at a speed of 2 million kilometers per hour, that is to say almost 1.2 million miles per hour. Mysterious exocomets have also been observed, but their origin is still unknown. But in what do these stars or comets evolve? They bathe in the interstellar medium, which is a mixture of gas, dust, and cosmic rays. The closer the galactic center is, the denser the concentration of stars and globular clusters. On the other hand, the further away from the galactic core, the more the density of stars decreases, making the nebulae disappear. Now, let's fasten our belts. After having observed the Milky Way from Earth, I propose to embark on an interstellar journey through our beautiful galaxy. Are you ready? Prepare for takeoff. Our journey begins with the exploration of our natural satellite, the Moon. 384,000 kilometers or 238,000 miles separate us from it. A car with an average speed of 100 kilometers per hour or 60 miles per hour would need 160 days to reach its destination. But I propose a trip at the speed of light. Less than a second is enough to reach the moon. The diameter of the moon is 3,500 kilometers, or 2,100 miles, or one-third the diameter of the Earth. The moon is a rocky satellite whose surface is strewn with craters. These are the result of numerous collisions with asteroids, which have lasted for billions of years. Devoid of atmosphere, without water or vegetation, its landscape does not change over time. 
In fact, you've probably noticed that we can always see the same side of the moon. This is due to the fact that its rotation is synchronous with that of the Earth, as well as its period of revolution. This synchronicity is due to the fact that the moon was formed during a collision between the Earth and a very large asteroid 4.5 billion years ago. A large agglomeration of debris gathered, then created our moon. However, its appearance changes according to its alignment with the Earth and the Sun, because the moon does not emit any light, it only reflects the light of the Sun. Thus, when the Earth is perfectly aligned between the Sun and the Moon, the Moon is in the Earth's shadow, this is called a lunar eclipse. In addition, the Moon can take on an orange-red color when the Sun's rays pass through the Earth's atmosphere. Apart from the Sun and the Moon, you've most likely already observed a star shining alone in the sky. Easily spotted in the morning and evening in the darkened sky, it is called the Shepherd Star. It is in fact the planet Venus. Venus is the second planet of the solar system that one meets while moving away from the Sun. 41 million kilometers separate it from our planet Earth, that is to say, more than 25 million miles. Its size and geology make it the twin sister of our planet Earth. However, it receives almost twice the intensity of solar radiation. The average temperature of its surface is 460 degrees Celsius, or 860 degrees Fahrenheit. The consequences of this extreme environment is due to its thick, cloudy atmosphere, which causes a greenhouse effect in an atmospheric pressure 95 times higher than on the Earth. Life is thus impossible there. The Venusian year is shorter than its day. Its very slow rotation in the opposite direction of that of the Earth requires 243 terrestrial days to accomplish a complete turn on itself. On the other hand, only 225 days are necessary to make a revolution around the Sun. Let's now discover the last planet that separates us from the Sun, Mercury. This planet, although the closest to the Sun, is also the smallest of the solar system, with a diameter of 4,879 kilometers, or 3,000 miles. When it is located at its closest to the Earth during its revolution around the Sun, it is 90 million kilometers, almost 56 million miles. More than 2,600 days would be necessary to reach it with a space probe, but today we travel at the speed of light and five minutes are enough to reach it. Like the Earth and Venus, Mercury is telluric, that is to say that it is composed of rocks and metals. Because of the bombardment of its surface by solar winds, it is almost devoid of atmosphere. Consequently, it undergoes temperature variations without equal in the solar system. Being able to reach more than 430 degrees Celsius or 860 degrees Fahrenheit in the day and drop to minus 180 degrees or 356 degrees Fahrenheit in the night. Its surface, riddled with craters, is very similar to that of the Moon. It alternates between rocky desert and hot or icy lava. After facing the temperatures of Mercury and Venus, we can dive into the heart of our imposing master's sun. This medium massive star, or yellow type, whose diameter reaches 1.4 million kilometers, or almost 1 million miles, is the center of our solar system, around which the planets orbit. 25 terrestrial days are necessary for it to make a complete turn on itself. The Sun alone represents 99.8% of the mass of the solar system. Its size corresponds to 110 times that of the Earth. Its distance from the Earth of 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles, protects us from its heat, the temperature of its surface reaching 5500 degrees Celsius, almost 9932 degrees Fahrenheit. The core of the Sun occupies one-fifth of its overall volume, and its temperature is between 1.5 and 15 million degrees, that is, between 2.7 and 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. It is here that nuclear fusion of hydrogen atoms takes place, 
which releases solar energy in the form of photons. These take 100,000 years to reach the photosphere, that is, the visible surface of the sun in the form of light and heat. As for the sun's atmosphere, it is subject to an intense magnetic field, and the plasma that makes it up is the site of solar flares, which in turn generate solar winds. However, like all stars, our sun has a limited lifespan. At 5 billion years old, it is halfway through its existence as such. When it reaches 10 billion years of total existence, it will lose luminosity to evolve into a red giant before finally dying out. Back on our beloved planet Earth, I now propose to travel even further. Let's leave the heart of our solar system and discover the Milky Way. What if we went in search of Martians? After Venus, Mars is the second closest planet to Earth, about 70 million kilometers or 43 million miles away. Mars is also in perpetual motion around the Sun, and its elliptical orbit keeps it far from us most of the time. When the Earth takes one year to go around the Sun, it takes Mars almost two years to accomplish the same. Your journey today is at the speed of light and it takes only a few minutes to reach this beautiful red planet, half the size of Earth, with a diameter of 6,794 kilometers, or 4,200 miles. Its distance from the Sun gives it average temperatures around minus 65 degrees Celsius, or negative 85 degrees Fahrenheit, especially since its atmosphere is 150 times less dense than that of the Earth, offering a very limited greenhouse effect. Temperatures therefore fluctuate between minus 133 degrees Celsius and plus 27 degrees, i.e. between negative 207 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The atmosphere of Mars is constantly charged with dust composed in part of iron oxide, which explains the more or less ochre hue of its sky, depending on the season. Its surface is also the scene of large dust devils when they're not frozen. Mars has no water neither ocean, nor sea, nor river runs through it. But it has many mountains, including Mount Olympus, which culminates at 26 kilometers in altitude, or 16 miles in height. It is, moreover, the highest volcano in the solar system. From Mars, we can observe its two natural satellites, Deimos and Phobos, which, like our moon, orbit around it. Let's resume our journey through our Milky Way. We will cross the asteroid belt that separates Mars from Jupiter. But don't worry, our journey at the speed of light will only encounter a few jolts without damage. This zone, like a belt, surrounds the center of the solar system that we have just traveled through, most certainly composed of remnants of the primitive solar system which never agglomerated to form a planet this belt contains three main categories of asteroids. In the first outer part, closer to Jupiter, we can see C-type asteroids, rich in carbon, which represent 75% of all visible asteroids in the belt. The second part, the innermost part of the belt, represents 17% of the asteroids. These, of type S, are mainly charged in silicates. Finally, the third part, the one closest to Mars, represents only 10% of the asteroids. Of type M, these are rich in metals. Several hundred thousand asteroids orbit our galaxy. Some are the size of a grain of dust. Others, called planetoids, are a few hundred kilometers in diameter. Among the celestial objects that make up the asteroid belt, we can cite the four largest, Ceres, Vesta, Pallas, and Hygiea. Between them, they represent almost half of the total mass of the belt. Ceres is even considered a dwarf planet and represents one-third of the total mass. An average of one million kilometers separates each asteroid, but one of them has caught the attention of astrologers. It is Antiope, a binary C-type asteroid, dark and carbonaceous, composed of two bodies of 90 kilometers each, or 56 miles, which revolve around the same center of gravity. They're only separated by 170 kilometers, almost 105 miles. 
Despite this, you can rest assured that the asteroid belt is essentially empty. Your journey to Jupiter on the other side of the asteroid belt takes place in cosmic serenity. After traveling at the speed of light, the 550 million kilometers or 340 million miles that separate Mars from Jupiter, after crossing the asteroid belt, we can admire more closely this giant, which we are used to observing from our Earth. Indeed, Jupiter is the fourth brightest object in our starry sky, after the Sun, the Moon, and Venus. Jupiter is the fifth planet of the solar system, but this ranking takes into account the distance of the planets from the Sun because Jupiter is the largest planet in our system by its size. By itself, it represents a size greater than all the other planets of the solar system combined. Its equatorial radius measures 71,492 kilometers, almost 45,000 miles, or more than 11 times that of the Earth. It travels through the galaxy at an orbital speed of 47,052 kilometers an hour, almost 29,000 miles per hour, and completes the orbit around the Sun in 11.86 years. Its rotation on itself is very fast and requires only 10 hours, causing a centrifugal acceleration at the equator. This effect is visible from the Earth with a simple telescope. We can then distinguish the oblate shape of Jupiter, whose equator is bulging and the two poles flattened. Approaching the planet, we can distinguish three rings, dark, composed mainly of dust. The first one is called Gossamer, with a width of 95,700 kilometers wide, almost 60,000 miles, it is also very thick. A second ring, called the main ring, is 7,000 kilometers wide almost 4,500 miles. This one is very thin and quite bright. Finally, we discover the third ring of toric shape and 22,000 kilometers wide, almost 14,000 miles, named Halo. This set of rings forms the Jovian ring system, which surrounds the gas giant. Although Jupiter is the largest of the planets, it is not the densest, because it is mainly composed of gas. Thus, it does not belong to the so-called telluric planets like the Earth. It has no real surface, and its composition is similar to that of our Sun. If it has a rocky core, it is at the heart of a mantle made of metallic hydrogen for the most part, but also of helium. Traces of ammonia, methane, and water are also detectable. Jupiter's rapid rotation, combined with its gaseous composition, generates an atmosphere recognizable by its alternating bands of color, depending on the latitude, shades of brown and cream. Jupiter has a tumultuous weather system, strong turbulence, even storms with violent winds of 600 kilometers an hour or 370 miles per hour appear along these colored bands. In addition, a red spot as large as three to four times our Earth is visible. It is a giant tornado it carries a lot of dust. Jupiter, whose components are essentially gaseous, has multiple atmospheric layers. Our journey takes us first into the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. This thin layer is composed mainly of hydrogen. It is more than 1,226 degrees Celsius, or more than 2,230 degrees Fahrenheit. As we dive into this upper atmosphere, the temperature quickly drops, to minus 236 degrees Celsius, or negative 392 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun's rays are no longer sufficient to warm this lower zone. Violent winds cause turbulence, strong enough to allow the different atmospheric components to mix. We find about 90% of hydrogen and 10% of helium in tiny quantities of methane. Then acetylene and ethane appear because of the solar ultraviolet radiation which breaks the methane molecules and then recombines them into hydrocarbons. Ammonia was also detected. We have only traveled one-tenth of Jupiter's atmosphere and the temperature is minus 261 degrees Celsius or negative 437 degrees Fahrenheit. We are in the coldest part of Jupiter's atmosphere. This is the tropopause. From this zone, the temperature will start to rise again 
continuously to the center of the planet. The ammonia content increases, creating a white cloud layer, and new chemical elements appear. At a distance of about 57,000 kilometers or 35,000 miles below this cloudy zone, we reach the upper limit of the solid core of the planet Jupiter. It is very hot there. The temperature reaches more than 19,726 degrees Celsius, or more than 35,400 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, Jupiter emits 1.7 times more energy than it receives from the Sun, or 70%. In order to continue our journey without any problems, we'll resume our interstellar journey in more comfortable areas. The environment near Jupiter is full of surprises, and for good reason. Jupiter is one of the planets of the solar system that has the most natural satellites. There are 79 known moons orbiting around it, but we will focus on the four moons discovered by Galileo, the Galilean moons. The four largest celestial objects orbiting Jupiter are, in order of discovery, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. These four moons were formed in orbit around the planet. They are therefore regular moons. Io is the closest moon to Jupiter. Its diameter, greater than that of our moon, is about 3,643 kilometers, or 2,200 miles. Its revolution around Jupiter is completed in 1.77 days. Located at 421,800 kilometers, or 260,000 miles of its planet, it undergoes significant frictions in connection with the attraction between this last and its two neighboring moons. This is why it has a high level of geological activity on its surface, with more than 400 volcanoes, some of which are more than 500 kilometers high, or more than 310 miles. Its atmosphere is composed of sulfur dioxide, the second moon of Jupiter, Europa, is without a doubt the most attractive moon. Although very small, with a diameter of 3,122 kilometers, or almost 2,000 miles, and covered with a mantle of glowing ice 100 kilometers, or 60 miles thick, it could host a vast ocean, making aquatic life potentially conceivable. In addition, its atmosphere contains oxygen, thanks to the water vapor that's released by the interaction between light and its icy surface. This one goes around Jupiter in three and a half days. Concerning Ganymede, its diameter of 5,262 kilometers, or 3,200 miles, makes it the largest Galilean moon. It is also the largest object from the Sun exceeding the size of Mercury, and the brightest of the Galilean satellites. This moon, which goes around Jupiter in seven days, is composed of silicate and ice. It contains a liquid iron core, whose volume is greater than the volume of water contained by our planet Earth. The convection of this liquid core provides a magnetic field to this huge Galilean moon. Finally, let's discover the fourth moon of Jupiter, Callisto. It is the furthest from Jupiter. Moreover, it seems to be less sensitive to the magnetic field of its planet. Its diameter of 4,821 kilometers almost 3,000 miles, makes it a celestial object also of great size. However, its density is lower. Its geological surface is older than the other three moons visited before, and its thin atmosphere is composed of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Its characteristics suggest that liquid water oceans may exist underground. Concerning the 75 other satellites of Jupiter, only four other moons are called regular. These belong to the Amalthea group. These moons are called Thebe, Amalthea, Adraste, and Metis. Their orbit is also closer to Jupiter, and their rotation is the same as the other moons already visited. As for the other moons, called irregular, their distance from Jupiter is very large, and their orbits are elliptical. After having examined Jupiter, I propose to continue our galactic journey. We will now head, still in our solar system, and still in the Orion arm, towards the sixth planet, Saturn. If we choose our moment well, we can take advantage of a distance between Jupiter and Saturn 
reduced to 540 million kilometers, almost 340 million miles. When Jupiter leaves the constellation of Aquarius to join the constellation of Capricorn, it is then located as close as possible to Saturn, itself located in the heart of Capricorn. The two planets are constantly in motion, so they each follow their own trajectory and can move away from each other up to 2.3 billion kilometers, or 1.4 billion miles. At the speed of light, it only takes about 30 minutes to approach Saturn and its prominent ring system. These are so imposing that a simple amateur telescope can offer you a breathtaking spectacle from Earth, provided you choose the right period. But today, we will get closer than ever before to these incredible rings. Their diameter extends over nearly 400,000 kilometers, or 250,000 miles, which is almost the distance between Earth and our Moon. There are seven of them, and they are thin, not exceeding one kilometer or one mile for most of them. Like a necklace located at the equatorial height of Saturn, they shine enough to make this planet even more extraordinary. Depending on the revolution of the planet Saturn, we can observe the shadow of its rings projected on it. The planet Saturn is then covered with black bands, contrasting wonderfully with its clear colors. If these rings seem to be continuous, they are made up of between 95 and 99% pure water ice, the rest being composed of dust and rocks. Their size can be from a few millionths of a meter to a few hundred meters. The objects that make up the rings, if they are essentially all of the same structure, do not, however, have the same orbit around Saturn. These seven rings have been named by the first seven letters of the alphabet. Thus, as they were discovered, we find the rings A, B, C, D, E, F, G. However, this classification does not determine their position relative to Saturn. E is the most eccentric ring, followed by G, F, a, B, C, D being the closest ring to Saturn. You can see that these rings do not touch each other. They are all separated by dark areas with little matter, called divisions. Moreover, within a ring, there are also other areas identified as gaps, where the density of particles is very low. Thus, we can see that a single ring seems itself made up of a multitude of small rings, or ringlets. Some rings are larger or denser than others. The rings A, B, and C are recognized as being the densest rings. They have a larger amount of material than the other rings of the Saturnian system. Their thickness is estimated to be between 5 meters or 16 feet and 20 meters or 66 feet only. The A ring, the largest of the three, has two gaps near its outer edge and a multitude of large-scale dynamic structures. The Cassini division separates it from the B ring. The latter is the densest and widest of the three. Very opaque, it contains many small volume structures. We note that the distance that separates it from Saturn is not constant. Indeed, the moon Mimas, which also orbits Saturn, disturbs the inner edge of the B ring. We finally see the C ring, which is the innermost of the three main rings. Composed of many bright plates, narrow gaps, and some very narrow rings, this ring is nicknamed the Pancake Ring because of its semi-transparent appearance. The closer we get to Saturn's rings, the more magical the show becomes. The four other rings, more diffuse, appear then. We can admire a chaotic show of materials, with anarchic movements, collisions, accumulations of materials, waves. In reality, there is a permanent agitation within each ring, which themselves undergo complex interactions with some of Saturn's satellites, whether they are permanent or ephemeral. Although Saturn's rings cannot go unnoticed, their accumulated matter would not represent more than a globe of 100 kilometers in diameter, almost 60 miles in diameter. Their creation is still a mystery. The rings seem to be younger than Saturn. Would they be the remains of a comet disintegrated by the gravity of the planet during a passage too close to it? Or could they be the fragments of a moon hit by a large celestial object which could not escape Saturn's environment, ending up in orbit around it? In any case, these fragments make Saturn, apart from its large size, one of the most fascinating planets. Saturn 
Saturn is known to be the second largest planet by size and mass after Jupiter. Its diameter of 120,536 kilometers or 74,000 miles is equivalent to nine times that of the Earth. Saturn is a gas giant that completes its revolution around the Sun in just under 30 years. Its rotation time, relatively fast, is estimated at 10 hours and explains its slightly flattened appearance at the poles, especially since it has a very low density, nearly eight times less than that of the Earth. It is also the only planet with a density lower than that of water. Saturn's atmosphere consists of three layers. The outermost layer, composed of dihydrogen and helium gas, is dotted with clouds. Gusts of wind up to 1,800 kilometers an hour or 1,100 miles per hour are constantly blowing through it. Its middle atmospheric layer with a temperature of 6,000 degrees Celsius or 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit is made of liquid hydrogen. Then the layer closest to the core is composed of liquid metallic hydrogen. The hydrogen is then an atomic form, creating an ocean of liquefied metal thus generating a powerful magnetic field. The core with an estimated diameter of 25,000 kilometers or 15,500 miles is a mixture of rock and molten metal, whose temperature exceeds 11,700 degrees Celsius or 21,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But let's go back to Saturn's surroundings and discover two of its satellites, among the 82 known. Let's start with the moon Enceladus. It is the 14th natural satellite of Saturn by distance, but the 6th by size. It is located in the E-ring, the furthest from Saturn. This moon, which measures only 500 kilometers or 310 miles in diameter, nevertheless has amazing characteristics. Indeed, one can visualize fountains of extraterrestrial seawater. Curiously, these fountains project into the atmosphere a good number of elements fundamental to the development of life as we know it. This moon can thus give us hope that life beyond Earth could one day become a reality. Under its icy shell, we can imagine that an ocean of seawater is at the origin of these eruptions of icy jets. Moreover, these icy waters contain many complex organic molecules, suggesting that, if it is not just a matter of simple chemical reactions, extraterrestrial life could be present. Let's move a little further away from Saturn to observe its 23rd satellite in terms of distance, the moon Hyperion. Hyperion is the largest of Saturn's irregular moons and orbits beyond the E-ring. Its unusual shape leads us to believe that it is in fact a remnant of a larger moon that would have been pulverized during an impact between two celestial objects. Measuring 410 kilometers or 260 miles and of low density, it looks more like a disordered pile of rock debris, frozen carbon dioxide, methane, and nearly 40% vacuum. This explains its surface riddled with deep craters, giving it the look of a sponge with numerous shiny walls. Indeed, abundant areas of icy water contrast with the bottom of the craters darker, the average temperature of Hyperion being about minus 180 degrees Celsius or negative 292 degrees Fahrenheit. Moreover, this natural satellite rotates randomly, following it in a centric orbit. When its trajectory leads it to cross that of Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, their respective speeds vary. The two objects then begin a more or less rhythmic dance, offering us a cyclical and unusual spectacle. Let us resume our interstellar excursion and continue to move away from the sun. At the edge of the solar system, two ice giants welcome us with their bluish light, Uranus and Neptune. These two planets contrast with the deep blackness of space, which glitters with a thousand lights. Traveling at the speed of light, we still need 48 minutes to cover the distance between Uranus and Saturn. As we approach Uranus, the seventh planet of our solar system, we can see more and more clearly the rings that encircle this blue-green planet. These rings, 13 in number, are very dark for the ones closest to the center. On the other hand, the most distant rings are of brighter color, 
mainly composed of rocks and dust, they're only a few kilometers wide and are therefore much less extraordinary than those of Saturn. Uranus is one of the four giant planets. Its diameter, which is four times that of the Earth, reaches more than 51,000 kilometers or 32,000 miles. Its axis of rotation is inclined by more than 90 degrees and gives the impression that it is rolling on its orbit. This gives it the nickname of the planet lying down. At a distance of 2,870 million kilometers or 1,700 million miles from the Sun, its revolution around the latter lasts more than 84 years. Its atmosphere, composed mainly of hydrogen and helium, reveals layers of clouds at different altitudes. At the top of these clouds, which are more dynamic at the time of the equinox, the temperature is minus 220 degrees Celsius, or minus 428 degrees Fahrenheit. Uranus is the coldest planet of the solar system. Slightly denser than Saturn, Uranus is made of water, methane, and ammonia fluids, surrounded by a small rocky center. It is the presence of methane that gives Uranus its bright blue color. At its equatorial level, violent winds reach up to 900 kilometers per hour, almost 560 miles per hour. These winds blow in the opposite direction of the planet's rotation, but closer to the poles, they change direction and become prograde. Moreover, Uranus, as well as Venus, have the particularity to rotate in the opposite direction of all the other planets. Like every planet, Uranus has natural satellites. It has 27 known moons. Their mass, combined with that of the 13 rings, is very small and represents less than 0.02% of the planet's mass. There are 13 inner satellites which have the same characteristics and the same origin as the planet. Five major satellites, including Titania, which is the eighth largest satellite of the solar system, are identified. Finally, there are nine irregular satellites, whose orbits are the most distant from the planet. Some revolve in a retrograde way in their elliptical orbit. Concerning Neptune, two hours of travel at the speed of light is necessary to reach it. At a distance of 1630 million kilometers from Uranus, it is the eighth and last planet of our solar system. Its diameter, slightly smaller than that of Uranus, is close to 50,000 kilometers. Neptune has the same properties as Uranus. However, it has only five rings, also dark, thin, and composed of dust. Its atmosphere is also subject to violent winds that can reach 2200 kilometers per hour, as well as storms. Under its mantle of water, ice, ammonia, and methane at high temperature, Neptune has a core composed of silicates and iron whose temperature reaches more than 5000 degrees in its center. This is why, even though Neptune is further from the Sun, its temperature is slightly higher than that of Uranus with an average of negative 218 degrees Celsius. Neptune has half as many moons as Uranus. Among the 14 satellites that are listed, we cannot escape Triton. Triton alone represents more than 99.5% of the total mass orbiting Neptune. Its diameter of 2,700 kilometers or 1,000 miles makes it the seventh largest natural satellite in the solar system. Triton, among the large satellites of the solar system, is also the only one to have a retrograde orbit, that is to say, to turn in the opposite direction of its planet. This particularity probably comes from the fact that Triton would have been captured by Neptune while it was evolving as a dwarf planet within the Kuiper Belt. We are now indeed very close to the Kuiper Belt. This ring-shaped area, similar to the asteroid belt we've already passed through, is 20 times wider and 20 to 200 times more massive than the asteroid belt. On the other hand, it contains no asteroids, and therefore no rocky bodies. It is composed of much more volatile and frozen matter, such as water, methane, or ammonia. Therefore, it stores an incalculable number of comets that come through our Milky Way. However, three dwarf planets can be observed in the Kuiper belt, Pluto, Makemake, and Haumea. I propose to join Pluto, which, for a long time, 
was considered as the ninth planet of our solar system, no longer has this status since 2006. However, a recent study suggests that the scientific community made a mistake in removing Pluto from the list of planets in the solar system in 2006, relegating it to the rank of Plutoid. Pluto is the ninth largest object orbiting the Sun, with an equatorial diameter of 2,376 kilometers, almost 1,400 miles. This dwarf planet, whose diameter is smaller than that of our Moon, is the first trans-Neptunian object to be identified. Located at more than 4 billion kilometers, or 2.5 billion miles from our planet Earth, it takes us 1 hour and 30 minutes of travel at the speed of light to reach it from Neptune. 248 years are required to go around the Sun, as well as about 150 other objects that follow the same orbit, called Plutinos. But let's get closer to Pluto to better observe it. Its surface is covered with mountains and plains. We can also distinguish nitrogen glaciers, methane snow, as well as faults and even ice volcanoes. Its geological activity is therefore relatively active. Its average temperature due to its location at the edge of our solar system is approximately negative 230 degrees Celsius, or negative 382 degrees Fahrenheit. This dwarf planet is mostly composed of rocks, ice, methane, and nitrogen. Its atmosphere, very thin, appears in gaseous form when its revolution brings it closer to the Sun, then in the form of ice when it moves further away from it. We know six satellites to Pluto, including Charon, which is the largest with a diameter of 1,212 kilometers, or 750 miles. Pluto and Charon, by their similar strength, attract each other and thus rotate one around the other around the same central point. I now propose to continue our journey even further, beyond our solar system, to discover the hidden treasures of our Milky Way. Let's leave Orion's arm and head towards Sirius, this bright star which attracts our earthly eyes as soon as the sun weakens. Located in the constellation of the Great Dog, behind the famous Orion, this white star that shines just above our horizon line is the brightest star after our Sun. Moreover, Sirius A is 1.8 times larger than our Sun and 2.3 times more massive. Its temperature is more than 9600 degrees Celsius, more than 17,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus, its brightness is explained by its greater luminosity than the Sun, but especially by its proximity to our solar system. Sirius is located more than 8 light years from our planet Earth. This star does not travel alone in our galaxy because it is a binary star. Indeed, Sirius A is accompanied in its revolution by Sirius B, which itself is a white dwarf. I now propose to travel 25 more light years to discover an exoplanet that's located in the zodiacal constellation of Leo, Gliese 436b. At a distance of about 33 light years from Earth, this one is quite spectacular. Although its mass is equivalent to that of our Earth, it is not a large celestial object, but we can admire its huge cometary trail, composed of hydrogen and a cloud that surrounds it nicknamed the Behemoth. This red dwarf takes on the appearance of a giant comet. Despite a temperature of about 250 degrees Celsius, 420 degrees Fahrenheit, its main elements have the strange appearance of hot ice, which is maintained in a solid state thanks to the high pressure of the outer layers, compressed by the planet's gravity. What if I told you that only a handful of light years away, I could take you to a super Earth type planet? Seven light years away, in the constellation of Ophiuchus, a planet orbits the star Gliese 1214, and you won't believe your eyes. This is probably the first ocean planet discovered, Gliese 1214b. At a distance of 40 light years from our solar system, its diameter is about 2.5 times larger than the planet Earth. The temperature of its surface, estimated at 200 degrees Celsius, or 392 degrees Fahrenheit, 
is maintained by a thick atmosphere, which increases the greenhouse effect. Gliese 1214b is entirely covered with water, composed of 75% ice and 25% rock and metal. The ocean of ice, which completely covers the planet, seems to have a depth of 13,000 kilometers, or 8,000 miles. The radius of its rocky core is only 4,000 kilometers, less than 2,500 miles. Unfortunately, although this ocean planet may look inviting, the presence of life as we know it remains unlikely, for now. Let us now go even further. Let's travel another 450 light years to the constellation of the Unicorn to discover another super-Earth, Korot 7b. This planet is considered to be the smallest telluric planet discovered outside our solar system. Its mass is estimated at 5 times that of the Earth, and its diameter at 1.7 times that of the Earth, which places it in the category of the lightest exoplanets listed to date. Core 7 b thus obtains the rank of Super-Earth. It makes the revolution around its star Core 7 in 20 hours. This revolution is all the faster because 2.5 million kilometers or 1.3 million miles only separates the two bodies. Core 7 b is thus the closest and fastest exoplanet to its star, orbiting at 750,000 kilometers per hour, or more than 460,000 miles per hour. But this distinction also confers to this exoplanet an unwelcoming climate, with temperatures exceeding 2,000 degrees Celsius, almost 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit, on its side exposed to its star, and on the contrary, on the hidden side, less than 200 degrees Celsius, or negative 360 degrees Fahrenheit. This exoplanet must certainly be covered with lava or boiling oceans. Recent studies have detected the presence of a second super-Earth, Corit 7c, whose mass is eight times that of the Earth. Further away from the star Corit 7, this planet revolves around its star in three days and 17 hours. After this sulfurous stop, let's continue our journey to the constellation of the Swan. Another surprise awaits you here, 1550 light years away from Earth. This constellation is crossed by our Milky Way, and thus includes several star clusters, as well as nebula. Several bright stars are easily spotted, including one in particular, Deneb. It marks one of the corners of the Summer Triangle, which is visible during all summer nights. This white supergiant star is also the brightest in this triangle, the other two being Altair, which is located in the constellation of Eagle, and Vega in the constellation of Lyra. But let's go back to the heart of the constellation of Cygnus to discover, within a triple star system, an exoplanet named HD 188753AB. This planet, located at about 151 light years from Earth, is of the hot Jupiter type, which means that it is similarly a gas giant. However, this planet is only 8 million kilometers or 5 million miles from its main star, seven times less than the distance between Mercury and the Sun. Its orbit places it between the main star and the other two, which are much further away. These two, which revolve around each other, complete their revolution around the main star in more than 25 years, while 80 hours are enough for the planet to complete it. I'll let you imagine the view from this three-star planet. If you want to be immersed in a starry universe, we must look at open clusters. True jewel boxes of the cosmos, they group together between 100 to 10,000 stars of the same age and link together by gravitation. About 444 light years from Earth, in the very old constellation of Taurus, are the Pleiades or M45 clusters which form the most beautiful open cluster in the night sky. There are nearly 3,000 stars in this cluster, a dozen of which are visible to the naked eye from Earth in the fall. Your galactic journey takes you through a cloud of dust that reflects the starlight. 
at the heart of this nebula, among the brightest stars, nine have names from Greek mythology. Atlas and Pleione, as well as their seven daughters, Asterope, Merope, Electra, Maya, Tegetus, Seleno, and Alcyone illuminate the space with their brightness. Asterope has, moreover, the particularity of being a double star. The cluster of the Wild Duck, also named M11, is located in the constellation of the Shield of Sobieski, about 6,120 light years from Earth. It is the most crowded open cluster in terms of stars, as it holds approximately 3,000. Its density is significant since the stars are distant on an average of only one light year. In addition, some stars are yellow giants, very bright. This cluster must have existed for 220 million years. But one cannot explore open clusters without making a stopover in the double cluster of Perseus. Located at the border between Cassiopeia and Perseus, these two clusters, NGC 884 and NGC 869, are more or less 10 million years old. Born from the same interstellar cloud, they are relatively close to each other, and at first glance, they appear to be one and the same. Although they both contain many blue and white supergiants, only the second one has a significant number of red supergiants, confirming that it is at a more advanced stage of stellar evolution. Would you like even more brightness and sparkle? Globular clusters outshine open clusters. Globular clusters are very dense stellar clusters, which can contain a few hundred thousand stars distributed in a sphere whose size can reach several hundred light years. These thousand star spheres are located in the galactic halo and orbit around the core of our galaxy. 158 globular clusters have been identified in our Milky Way, but they're certainly at least 10 to 20 times more numerous. Half of these clusters are located near the constellations of Sagittarius, Ophiuchus, and Scorpio. Their stars more than 10 billion years old are the same age as the oldest stars in our Milky Way. Let's take a closer look at one of the best known globular clusters, the Great Hercules Cluster, or M13 in the Messier Catalog. Located more than 25,000 light years away in the constellation of Hercules, this globular cluster is one of the largest objects listed in this catalog created in 1774 by Charles Messier. Located on the outskirts of our Milky Way, M13 gathers several hundred thousand small mass, cold, and red stars. Visible to the naked eye from the northern hemisphere of our Earth, it appears in the darkness of the sky as a round fuzzy spot. As you approach this cluster, which measures 145 light years in diameter, you don't know where to look because there are so many stars. In fact, it is easy to spot the center of M13, which is the place where the concentration of stars is the densest. The proximity of its stars is such that some collisions are unavoidable, generating the appearance of young massive stars, the blue stragglers. The latter are then very numerous in the heart of the cluster. Some of them, rather red-orange, arrive at the end of their life. Their surface temperature decreases between 2,000 and 4,000 degrees Celsius, that is to say between 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit and 7,200 degrees Fahrenheit. The others of cold color, blue and white, are therefore at the beginning of life. Their temperature can reach up to 20,000 degrees Celsius or 36,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But among this myriad of luminous stars, one star stands out from the others by its brightness. It is the variable star V11, which is part of the Red Giants. There are currently 64 variable stars, including V11, but the discoveries are continuous, the latest dating from 2022. But what happens when a star disappears? We talk about Red Giants that are at the end of their life, but what happens to them when they die? What happens to the matter which composes them? For stars massive enough at the time of their disappearance, these stars cause a gigantic explosion in the universe. This is called a supernova. 
for others, as will become our sun, not hot enough at the end of its life, will gradually die out until becoming a dead star, which is called a black dwarf. For the others, which would have had the chance to revive, in the form of a gigantic explosion called supernova, a cloud of gas and dust is released. The debris then projected form an interstellar cloud, composed like the star of gas and dust. It is in these clouds that stars are born. It is therefore an infinite cycle, because as we already know, the stars are born of the agglomeration of materials within a nebula. The gases contained in this agglomerate rotate very quickly, increasing the temperature and thus causing a nuclear reaction. The ball of gas then becomes a star that shines brightly, surrounded by a nebula more or less dense. Some bright nebula are part of the diffuse nebula. They are emission nebula that radiate light from the gas that compose them, or reflection nebula which reflect the light of the stars located nearby. Other nebula are said to be obscure because they block the light, but we cannot be satisfied with distinguishing only two categories of nebula. Some are even more particular. This is the case of the Horsehead Nebula, located in the constellation of Orion. This dark nebula is next to a bright nebula. The latter gives a red color to the hydrogen that separates them. The Horsehead Nebula, composed of a dense cloud of gas and dust, stands out gracefully against this red background. In the constellation Sagittarius, another nebula is even more sensational, the Trifid Nebula, or M20. Trifid is the 20th object listed in the Messier catalog. Its location makes it close to the central bulge of our galaxy. This emission nebula has the particularity of being crossed by a dark, digitized nebula which gives it its distinctive appearance. This relatively bright disk, which is a fairly regular luminosity, except in the meanders of the dark nebula, is joined to a second disk slightly smaller. At the heart of each of these two disks, we visualize a star, one of which is triple. One part, composed of ionized hydrogen, sends back a red light, while the other part, being a nebula by reflection, sends back a bluish light. Still in the same constellation, the Lagoon Nebula, M8, is one of the most exceptional nebula. It is a huge cloud of hydrogen and dust illuminated by a blue supergiant, the Star of Sagittarius. The latter, two million times brighter than our sun, allows us, in very good conditions, to observe this nebula with the naked eye from Earth. About 110 light years in size, it contains a beautiful open cluster of young and very hot stars. If the nebulae can have a more or less strong luminosity and varied colors, the planetary nebulae are even more spectacular. These celestial bodies, composed of rarefied gas, plasma, or interstellar dust, take the form of disks, like planets, hence their name. I propose to join the constellation of Lyra in order to discover its planetary nebula, M57, also called the Ring Nebula. 3,000 to 6,000 years old, it looks like a ring with a diameter of no less than 2.4 light years. Its central part is quite dark because it emits only ultraviolet rays. On the other hand, its outer ring takes more and more luminous colors, ranging from green to yellow, orange to red. This nebula turns out to be composed of the debris of a star at the end of its life, whose gases expelled a few thousand years ago from this extraordinary ring. We have traveled through the Milky Way and have gone to the farthest reaches of it. However, we have not yet reached the central zone around which our galaxy revolves. The galactic arms we have visited, containing so many cosmic wonders, all have a common starting point. Located nearly 26,673 light years from our solar system, it is the luminous center of the Milky Way, in which a supermassive black hole is hidden by thick clouds of dust and gas. This huge black hole is called Sagittarius A. Like a huge donut, it swallows in its center all the light that approaches it. Its orange ring of toric shape is its accretion disk. It is composed of superheated gas that revolves around the black hole and dissipates into light. 
Sagittarius A measures 12 million kilometers in diameter, more than 7 million miles, and its mass is more than 4 million times that of our Sun. But let's be careful not to get too close. Sagittarius A's gravity is such that it sucks in everything that comes near it without ever giving its catch a chance to escape, unless, perhaps, it can be faster than the speed of light. What if Sagittarius A was a door to the stars, opening us to other horizons?